do something new is really about having the courage to take a moment and really celebrate it and finding a way to move beyond simply seeing and looking to really deep observation or deep listening. It's about going further than I normally would. Welcome to Rise Leaders Radio. I'm your host, Leanne Mallory. As a leadership coach, I work inside organizations and I focus on helping leaders achieve their whole person potential and meaningfully contribute to their organization's mission. With this podcast, I share leadership best practices, developmental approaches, and stories of exemplary leaders. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling like I need a big dose of wonder. It's December 2021, and we're still in the soup of the pandemic, political divisiveness, social challenges, supply chain challenges, labor shortages, economic ups and downs, and so many of us overcommitted at work and dealing with social media's efforts to hijack our attention. It's exhausting. Every day, I read another statistic about our individual and collective burnout. Does this speak to your situation? Putting our attention on wonder allows us to step outside of this giant hairball of stress. When we're in wonder, we're curious, we're open, we're seeing things with new eyes and from different perspectives. Instead of feeling stuck, we're learning and we're growing. And you just might find yourself experiencing some delight. The field of neuroscience is finding that when we're in a state of awe, which is an important component of wonder, we're more likely to feel present and connected to the world around us and less likely to engage in rumination and feeling stress. I'll take some of that. So the time seems perfect to replay this episode focused on wonder. I recorded this episode with the extraordinary Bonnie Pittman in January of 2020 when we had no idea what was coming our way. Bonnie had brought together art and neuroscience to create two tools, do something new and the power of observation. And of course, both of these are linked in the show notes. Bonnie works with doctors and medical students to teach them how to be better observers of the patients they are treating. I have used the power of observation tool with leaders at art museums and the results are magical. As an aside, be in touch with me if you're interested in taking the Be Well, Lead Well Pulse Assessment, which does measure wonder, or if you want to get your leadership team to a museum to experience the incredible impact wonder has on individual and collective leadership. Before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about Bonnie. She's the Distinguished Scholar in Residence for the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History at the University of Texas at Dallas, and also the Director of Art and Brain Innovations at the UT Dallas Center for Brain Health. She's the former director of the Dallas Museum of Art, or DMA, and author of six books that are primarily focused on public engagement with art, which continues to be a huge passion of hers. Bonnie left the DMA in 2012 due to serious health issues that resulted from cross-Atlantic travel. The challenges are significant and require weekly attention at medical facilities and limiting her exposure to big crowds and germy people. But in true Bonnie fashion, this health condition not only didn't stop her, it catalyzed the creation of the next version of herself. And the tools I mentioned before were created as a result of her time in isolation. And they came in really handy when she was in extreme isolation during the first year of the pandemic. I've just opened our conversation with a comment on how I feel that art helps put things into perspective 
by giving us alternate ways to experience the world and to get out of our heads and to focus on beauty. I say that I feel we don't spend enough time appreciating beauty. And Bonnie picks up here. Beauty is everywhere. And, you know, if we don't stop and celebrate it and enjoy those moments of awe and wonder, you're missing a great component of yeah, life. Yes. And I'm so glad that you brought that up because another thing mm-hmm. that meeting you has just been so serendipitous. I'm also very interested in awe and wonder mm-hmm. and leadership and well being. And so you're already years ahead of me with frameworks that you've created mm-hmm. that help put those things together. Mm-hmm. So I'm just seeing all these different frameworks come together. Yeah. So a little bit more history. So you left the Dallas Museum of Art in 2012 mm-hmm. due to some significant health issues right. that you still deal with. You spend mm-hmm. a lot of time and energy, even today, weekly managing all of the the health issues. And it was this time in life that actually someone said brought you to another iteration of your reinvention. Because of your experience and with this illness, you've created a whole new world for yourself. And I wonder if you could just start there and tell us how you moved from that part in life. I think Mm -hmm. it began in 2008 to being focused on awe and its impact on health. So just start there. Well, happily, the beauty of art and awe and wonder have been a part of my life period, you know, ever since I was a little girl. I was in love with paintings and sculptures and my grandparents and my mother were huge influences on me, taking me tirelessly to the museums. (laughs) I had a bunch of brothers and they couldn't have cared less about going to art museums, but my mom and my grandmother and grandfather really supported that. But going back to your question about 2008, I was in Europe negotiating an exhibition for the Dallas Museum of Art. And I went to Vienna and London. And in Vienna in particular, I picked up a virus that at the time we thought was just the flu, you know, and I came back and everybody was trying to treat me, but there was this problem. I just didn't get better. And so I coughed and coughed as I still do today. And my physicians were really stumped by this. And when they did the biopsies on my lungs, they found a mysterious organism. And there are only two people in the United States now that have this, which is kind of strange. And this person also was in Vienna at the same time. So it just means our immune systems were receptive to this little bug that was going around out there. And at any rate, it's found a happy home and it stays with me. And despite (laughs) all the treatments from great medical centers around the United States. I've learned how to manage it. I'm not going to be cured. And those years, the 2008 until I left in 2012 were really challenging years because I would go to the museum and we'd have an event or an opening or things like that. And two days later, I'd be in the hospital again because my immune system just, you know, somebody would be sick and I would get their infection. So the combination of just the exhaustion of being chronically ill, the receptivity of getting ill all the time just by traveling and doing my job was really frustrating. And so I made a decision with my physician to step down from my role as the director Mm -hmm. of the Dallas Museum of Art and what he said, which was pretty powerful at the time, now I think we have a chance of keeping you alive, was oh pretty pretty <laughs> startling. You said, oh, well, you could have told me that earlier. <laughs> He's been my physician since 2008. Mm. But what happened was in the summer of 2011, so I was had been sick for a while, that we had another biopsy. The biopsy came back and clearly indicated that the infection was still there. And and it was very upsetting because I had been through so many treatments and so many hospitalizations. I thought, surely I'm getting better. But unfortunately, I wasn't. And so I had to embrace that new understanding in my life. And I went home that afternoon from learning this news and 
my brother was with me happily, thank heavens. And I said to my brother, Mark, I'm going to take a nap. And when I woke up from my nap, I wrote down my do something new practice, which was, it was July the 8th, 2011. And it said, I'm going to take an ordinary day and make it extraordinary through the power of intention. And I will meet new people. I will go to new places. I will do new things with old friends. It can be big or little. So that allows flexibility in my life because on my what I call quiet days or sick days. I can't go out and, you know, do a lot. I have to do something there. It can be new flavors of ice cream, (laughs) which is really great. I don't know why I wrote that down, but it cannot be work and it cannot be medical and it cannot be something that I carry forward. So if I do a bunch of things in one day, I can't carry forward them to the next day. Okay. So for me, being with you in your place, interviewing you for this podcast on a Sunday, this is a beautiful, I wish everyone could see your your beautiful home here with (laughs) all the art. Do I get to count that as do something new, even even though though it's work? Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, you can choose that to, these are my parameters. Okay. You know, All right, so we can create our own write, parameters. You know, okay. when, I, when I teach this practice, I tell everybody, this is what I wrote down. You should write down what you want mm-hmm. it to be and not be in any way encumbered. So yes, you know, and being here is, if this is new to you and doing, you know, for me, it's the joy of sort of consciously choosing to have a deep experiences, hopefully, during the day multiple times where I just pause and refocus and say, oh, this is my do something mm. new today. Mm-hmm. I'm going to really try to see the different works of art in this person's home. I was at a luncheon last week and took a like 30 photographs of a friend's chairs and tables and her eggs in a bowl and everything. And then I sent her this collage I posted uh-huh. on Instagram. And she said, I've never seen my house that way. She said, I had no idea that oh, those were in there. So what it does for me is it causes me to focus deeply on the moment and to begin to, you know, I would say to you that she loves lines and she didn't really understand that, that a lot of her art is not color. It's about lines and structure. And this pattern reflects (sighs) everything all the way down to her dining room table with all the scratches and weathering that's happened. So it's a way Mm. for me to just stop in the rush of things and celebrate the beauty of things to really have joy, or it could be in a conversation. One of my favorite things is to, an old friend is coming over for dinner tonight, and I very intentionally called her because she's had this experience before and said, you're part of my new something, do something new today. And Julie said, wow, Bonnie, we've known each other for (laughs) so many years. And I said, yeah, just be prepared. I'm going to learn new things about you. So a lot of my friends who have been part of my practice for years know that when I I tell them you're part of the practice that day, that something's going to happen. Yeah, Yeah, something's going to happen. And it's learning about people and in depth, not just the surface of it. You know, we had a discussion when we first met one day at the Arboretum and a cardinal was sitting in a tree above our heads. And we talked about our mothers, both of whom had died. And that red cardinal stayed there in the tree until this (sighs) like hour long conversation was completed, that we had shared these stories of how much we loved our mothers and how much we fought with our mothers and all of these different things. But in that moment, in that very special moment of communing with a friend and changing your Mm -hmm. relationship from being casual friends to really sharing life stories was extraordinary. And at the end, the Cardinal flew away. And you were paying attention to that. And we were paying attention to that. Well, the other thing that strikes me about you sending all those photos, and aren't iPhones great? I mean, you always always have a camera and it's so easy, but you were doing another kind of listening. Yes. And reflecting back to her something that you saw that she didn't see. Right. And that is so gratifying right. because it's one thing, you know, we talk all the time, but you really were paying attention to her in a different way. Right. And now she can see, she learned something about herself right. by you sharing what you saw. Mm-hmm. And that's such a gift. Well, and she was thrilled by this because mm-hmm. we don't often have 
opportunities where somebody really reflects on you right. and learns from mm-hmm. you. And I did. I learned a huge amount from her uh-huh. about her books and her, you know, this neutrality of color that she loves grays and greens and, you know, but soft colors. Uh-huh. And, but that's not the way she dresses. She dresses very colorfully. So there were all these contrasts. Anyhow, those simple things, what Do Something New is really about is having the courage to take a moment and really celebrate it and finding a way in my life to move beyond simply seeing and looking to really deep observation or deep, as you just said, deep listening. It's about going further than I normally would. And, you know, of course, that can be translated in a thousand different Mm -hmm, ways. mm -hmm. So you just woke up one morning and it was just there. I wrote it down. Yeah, I can show you the page that I wrote it down on a piece of paper. And yeah, this is exactly what I wrote. Huh. I woke up and I have a pad by my bed. I don't Mm -hmm. know about you, but that's fascinating. And the other thing is what our brains are doing, what our minds are doing when we're sleeping. Right. And to capture that. What if you had not captured that? And then we would we may not have it. I wouldn't have had I mean, here we are on day three thousand, I think it's three thousand or three thousand and twenty two or something like that. It's days now. Now. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's a great question. I mean, the first couple of days, because Mark was with me, we did things like we played miniature golf, Uh you know, it was 105. So it was really stupid. (laughs) We went went for a walk down at the Audubon and got lost because we didn't pay attention to the trails. I never pay attention to markers or things Uh like that. I just sort of head out into the world and experiment experiment with the world. And then we went to a Transformer movie. But I realized that (laughs) after three days, you know, oh, I could really find something. Mm-hmm. And we had duck races in my, I collect rubber duckies. So we had duck races in my pool. And so, it, you know, you, <laughs> you can, you know, these were not. They don't have to be profound. No, in, these were not the profound world. things, yeah. but they have gotten to be profound. And more importantly, the discoveries of having done this practice for so long are really profound. Mm -hmm. In other words, you can take all these little incidents together, but I've discovered that one of the really important things which we've been talking about and comes from my meditation practice is the power of staying in the moment and to seeing old things in new ways or Mm -hmm. to seeing the world in new ways, to slow down and really invest in those moments and to just like when you're meditating, focus on your breathing, focus on the people or Mm -hmm. the place. I've learned, really affirmed the importance of compassion, compassion, not only to others, which is in many ways the easiest thing to do, Uh but much easier than being self-compassionate. And when you're chronically ill, self-compassion is hard work because you're angry. I was angry, really, really Mm. angry for years at my body and at myself, but I've given that up. (sighs) Um, And now through the practice of loving kindness, which Sharon Salzberg has, I've been to taught me so much about, I don't fight with my body anymore. Mm -hmm. I just accept, you know, this is a good day. This is a sick Mm -hmm. day, better known as a quiet day. I can wake up in the morning and feel great and at three o'clock in the afternoon, you know, crawl back in bed and Mm -hmm. think I'm never going to get out of this bed and maybe in that bed for three or four days. Interesting. But self-compassion has been a big thing. Play, the importance Mm -hmm. of play and playing with my friends, playing with myself in terms of doing things around the house that I have a whole drawer of (laughs) games and little things I can do. And sometimes I call up my friends and say, okay, we have a new game and you have to come over and play it with me. Or just being playful, I think, is really the celebration of the human experience. And that's how children learn. So even though I'm much older now, it's a way for me to re-engage in new things. Yeah. Um, You know, you mentioned Sharon Salzberg, and I've lifted one of her phrases. She and uh, Joseph Goldstein used Mm -hmm. the phrase, begin again, Mm -hmm. you know, as part of the meditation and coming back to your breath. Every day is a begin again. Is a begin again. Every moment is a begin again. So we have like multiple times 
in days and life right. to begin again. And it sounds like that's also what you're that, incorporating well, in there. Well, of course. And both Joseph Goldstein and Sharon have been, along with John kabat I've been around them a lot in terms of, I've been very fortunate to be able to go to teaching sessions with them and their friends. And the begin again is at the very essence of what Do Something New is. It's about oh, the good. full presence of, okay, I did, I did that and I'm over with, but how can I begin again? Yeah. Just like your wandering mind when you're meditating, it's perfectly natural to do that. Just, Just take a breath back, yeah. and come back to, to that moment. And be compassionate with yourself yes. when that happens. Yes. Just that whole cycle that whole is cycle. a practice of self-compassion right. too. It's not being angry with yourself when your mind wanders. Right. And I have to say, I learned self-compassion through my meditation and then began to really apply it to my physical body's illness, the wow. frailty of my physical body. And so it was a wonderful intersection of the two. Nice, nice. So can we talk a little bit now about, I know that you're mm-hmm. doing a lot of work with art and medicine. Yes. And in fact, I've heard, I heard you speak at the Nasher. You did a whole series mm-hmm. there where you facilitated conversations with physicians and neuroscientists and all of that on art and health. And you do your power of observation framework. Mm -hmm. Specifically, you've started with physicians. Mm -hmm. And so what's all that link there? Well, if you were in the hospital and in clinics as much as I was in 2008 to like 2012, I had to look for new ways of thinking about the world around me because it was shifting. And the shift was happening as a result of my not being able to travel as much and being more in Dallas and particularly more at Baylor. (laughs) Uh, In a single week, I could be there two times as normal, but three to five times during the week. And And that's even today. Oh, yeah, that's today. I mean, last last week, we were there for infusions and shots and new blood work and a major appointment with my physician to try to figure out why I was having a blood infection. And so it just goes on and on. And some people would give up, Mm -hmm. but that's not my nature. And what I would say, the practice of doing something new every day has developed my creative resilience. Mm. And that that creative resilience is I've always been resilient, but now I know how to do it creatively. Now I ha- know how to do it with compassion mm. towards myself. And I am much better at that than when I was in the beginning in you know 2008 to 12. But it's really developed in the last two or three years that I understand it now. Well, I've been doing it mm-hmm. for a long time, mm-hmm. eight years. That led into, because I was in the hospitals, I was talking to doctors, I was an art historian, and would have conversations about, we've got to fix this environment that really Mm. is in desperate need of new images on the walls. (laughs) Um, How can I train the physicians? You know, and I did a number of talks at Baylor and UT Southwestern, because I know I'm on committees for both of the hospitals about my practice of doing something new. And then the doctor said, well, we want to learn how to see the world the way you do. And I went, oh, well, I hadn't thought about that the same way. So that's a kind of a prerequisite skill to doing something new or no? No, I don't think so. I I think what they were, their world and many physicians, both medical students and after they become doctors and go through the various stages of their training and then they're operating as a full physician, It's like everybody, they're not trained in how to observe the world around them. They're not trained in the skills that we need for visual literacy any more than we're trained to learn how to hear. Mm -hmm. And yet 80% of the way you acquire information is through visual images. And particularly important for physicians is that ability to see if a patient over the days that they are seeing them in the hospital or in their clinics is evolving in a positive way or a negative way. Mm. And that need to be able to look quickly and observe quickly and get solid information to be able to remember it is something that's very important for them. And so I was stunned in the beginning that everybody didn't know how to do what I was doing. Mm -hmm, It was just mm -hmm. because it was, I've been doing it professionally through my museum career my entire life. So 
the physicians really and the students, the medical students really said, you need to write this down because I, okay. I, you need to help us, you know, because they learn through real science mm-hmm. and through methodologies that are quite different in many ways than the humanities. And they wanted something concrete that could help them. And my mushy waving of hands and being enthusiastic was great, but not enough. (laughs) So I, again, I mean, these are funny stories. I was wandering around, I was on a walk. And then when I came home for the walk, I took a nap and wrote down the framework for the power of observation. I woke up, it's evolved over the three years I've been working on it, but it was basically, oh, there are four levels. You know, we start with scanning the world around us. Uh Then we look more deeply, we attend to that and try to not analyze and create a judgment, but just like, oh, this is a microphone and a blue glass. And oh, there are two of them and we're matching, but they're in different places. Mm. So we're just attending. And then to make connections and the connections are really getting more information, learning from you. This is you know, your podcast equipment. And so you begin to then connect my life to your life. Uh I create some experiential understandings. I make values. This is when context is given to your observation. And so that's connecting. And then the last one, which was hard to come up with a word for, is really transforming. And transforming is when you personalize these actions and you take all this information and then you can put it into a new idea. And the doctors were the ones who pointed out to me, this is when we make a new diagnosis. We've got all this information. Okay. We've really looked at it, but we may think that you've had X, but now we're making the diagnosis and it could be Y, or we change our, our mm-hmm. points of view. And then I began to work with it. And once I was at the Center for Brain Health, I began to realize how very critical the senses were in learning. So as I've been teaching the framework for the power of observation, I now use sensory learning as much as possible. So it's not just your eyes, but I get your full body involved mm-hmm. in it and in transfer we do these activities that make specific connections between the personal. So you might write a poem, you might act out. If you're with me in the museum, I have people acting out what's going on in the painting. And then you figure out what was happening before, what was Uh happening after. And those tangible experiential moments transform a two-dimensional experience into memory in your brain. So now your hippocampus, your whole limbic system is working in a different way and at a higher level to codify this memory as Uh one that you're going to hold on to. Okay. So I just want to pause Mm -hmm. here. So a few things that you've said, first of all, love the term visual literacy. Mm -hmm. We have literacy on a lot of different things, but I had not heard visual literacy it's something to be paid attention to. Mm-hmm. Like you said, 80%, 80% of, what, of what we learn, what is, we through learn is through our eyes. Mm-hmm. And we can be very transactional about mm-hmm. it and not ask questions, or we can get to a next level uh, where right. we make meaning of it. Right. We, we transform that image into something that's meaningful. I'm going to say again, just the four levels or the mm-hmm. What are they, the four dimensions of the Four power? levels. Okay. Or, I don't think of them as levels, but okay. the four aspects. Four aspects. Yeah. And they are scanning, attending, connecting, and transforming. Mm-hmm. So those are the four aspects of the framework that you came up with. So I want to say something else. I did the SMART program mm-hmm. from BPI, right. and it reminds me, too, of zoom in, zoom out, mm-hmm. zoom deep and wide. Yep. So it feels a little bit like that too. Is there a connection between well, those it's two? Well, it's very interesting because I had written my framework and Sandy Chapman is a friend of mine and I had not read her book about the smart learning program that she developed. And Sandy invited me over to come and show her the power of observation. And she said, oh, honey, do you know about my SMART framework? And there are parallels <laughs> yeah. uh, between the two. And so... There's also parallels. I have a little chart that I made because I love charts that shows power of observation, do something new, and then smart. Because all of them have these, in my mind, have different ways of experiencing the world around. Mm -hmm. What the power of observation and do something new do that helps the work that the Center for Brain Health does in terms of learning and the smart program itself is it adds content. 
Mm -hmm. It adds deep meaning to what you're doing. Yes. That is, I think they use the word innovation. Okay. As opposed to transforming, if I remember correctly, in the last, last level. The framework for the power of observation, we developed, you know, it's like one of those things that happens in the world all the time that two people are in thinking about the same thing and come up with different answers. Sandy Chapman's and the work at the Center for Brain Health is very heavily based on research. Cognitive learning has been tested. You know, they have a whole methodology mm-hmm. for it. And that's one of the reasons she brought me to the Center for Brain Health is to- Because you're bringing a different aspect. I'm bringing another lens to yes. look at this and with both the do something new practice and the power of observation. So I lecture there all the time on those subjects. So I, I want to say too, that in the show notes, mm-hmm. I will- I know that you have a website for Do Something New. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I'll point to that Mm -hmm. in your Instagram because your Instagram account is current. The blog is really helpful because it explains Do Something New. Okay, and but it doesn't have the daily link to Instagram. But you can definitely give people the Instagram account. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll give all of that, and if it's okay with you, I'll also let people download a a PDF. This is the more the more current. We edited it down just a little bit. You know, okay, the great land of the debates on this language have been, you know, just enough. But the bottom line is that I'll link people to this framework. And I'm wondering, I have the story that there are so many ways that this could be used Mm -hmm. in a business setting. Like if you're looking at issues or problems Mm -hmm. or new things that you're trying to create, you could go through this framework individually or as a group. In fact, it might be fun to do it all individually and then compare what right. people have, you know, what they've come up with. On two of these, at least, it says, make no judgment, continue to look without judgment. Mm-hmm. So that it's kind of like taking the critical eye and the analysis off of it and just let yourself play around with it and be with whatever the issue is, right. whatever it is that you're contemplating, whether it's a piece of <clears throat> art or a business issue. Well, this I've used actually in work, the scanning, attending, connecting, transforming. I'm not as explicit about it, but I've used it in workshops that I've done with leaders okay. to have, you know, it's another equivalent to a brainstorming session, mm-hmm. but, you know, rather we're going to brainstorm. Let's just take a specific thing that we're focusing on as a problem and go through these steps. And you can move the group from sort of just generalizing the problem down to coming up with new solutions. Mm-hmm. And so you're right. It has many applications, many, many mm-hmm. applications. Mm-hmm. And I teach a course, as you know, to physicians at a number of hospitals here in Dallas. And I've done it with Southwest Airlines and a number of other corporations where they found it to be very successful. And I think as we, as the Center for Brain Performance develops, it will be a project that I develop hopefully for more use in corporations and other resources that are out there. Great. I will be glad to see that. (laughs) Yeah. One more thing that Mm -hmm. I want to talk about is this Speechless Different by Design which is an exhibit that the DMA and you consulted on that Mm -hmm. along with a curator from the DMA, Mm -hmm. Sarah, and with the neuroscientist Mm -hmm. at the BPI Center for, Mm -hmm. and also the artist, was it five Mm -hmm. different artists? Seven. Seven Uh different Mm -hmm. artists. All right. And it's a really different type of exhibit. Mm -hmm. It's very hands-on. I actually took a group of leaders through that And the timing was just perfect because I had been to your lecture the night before and you had art tutored me a little bit on how to do this already. It was so well received. Mm -hmm. The leaders that were in that program just adored it. And it was, it was a combination of being out of the office Mm -hmm. and just the joy, Mm -hmm. the play. And we actually did this. You basically said, told me how to walk people through it. Mm -hmm. And we did a scan first. And then when I let them know a little bit more about the exhibit, they could decide where they wanted to spend more time Mm -hmm. and engaged with it in a whole different way Mm -hmm. and had a lot more fun. They may have started out one place, but they actually found more joy Mm -hmm. somewhere else Mm -hmm. once they knew a little bit more about it. So you want to just say a few things about that exhibit? Yeah, it's an extraordinary achievement. And Sarah Schluning, who is the 
Chief Curator of Decorative Arts and Design. This is an idea she came to Dallas with from her previous museum in, at the High Museum in Atlanta. And Sarah wanted to do this great project. She had a lot of personal motivation. Mm-hmm. Her son has learning differences. And she came to me and said, who do we connect with? How do we get going here? And one of my skills is taking people from different contexts and putting them into new places. And I said, ah, this is easy. Let's put together an advisory group. And there are some wonderful people at the Center for Brain Health that we can connect with. And she was so excited because she had just gotten into understanding the neuroscience behind this. And so we had a wonderful convening very early on in the project, very, very early on with all of the artists and all of the neuroscientists. I think there were six or seven of them and also a person from Collier hearing center and Mm. some others. So there was a a variety of scientists involved in this. And they presented in this session how the brain works, what is sensory learning, where does that evolve in your brain and what areas does that manifest and what is autism? What are some of the real learning differences that will require you to understand those issues in your works? There are two works in there that are very dependent on sound. And Mm -hmm. so they have to figure out how to do that for a person who may have a hearing deficit. It was fascinating. And the artists were blown out of their mind about how different this was than anything else. And so they went off, the artists went off and collaborate and the scientists went off and went back to work. And then about a, a number of months later, maybe nine months later, because they were working on their designs, they came back and showed the scientists what was going on, the advisory group. And they got a lot of feedback, which you see in this exhibition. And It was very powerful because one of them, for example, the area that Ari did with the balloons that Mm -hmm. sort of inflate and fall, they reminded them that sound would be, you know, you have to pick what the experience is. And with these huge balloons floating, inflating, there's a lot of sound in Mm -hmm. that room. And so the sound plus the membranes pressing against you, plus this could be a sensory overload. So in the earlier version of this, some important changes were made to soften it. And each of the artists learned something new about themselves and found that the neuroscientists added insight into their work. So the dialogues, and also there were personal dialogues. Of Mm -hmm. course, some of the people made real connections with Tandra or at the center and that artist would then speak to her personally. So it was a wonderful transformation for mm-hmm. both sides. Yeah. The, yeah. The neuroscientist, I think almost everybody who was on the team and certainly many, many other people at the Center for Brain Health made the scrolls for the lab yes. exhibition. And if you look at the thousand plus people that made those scrolls from the Dallas community, you'll see dozens of Center for Brain Health. So here were all these scientists and they still come up to me and say, when can we have another project like this? Because <laughs> it got them, just like you were talking about your CEOs, out of their labs and into experiencing and each of those roles that you made with the Lad Brothers, you told stories. So they're just not colorful roles. They're really memories. That is a memory palace that you're walking into. So there's one in there that is a memory about that I got up and told the whole group about my mom. So each person, when you make your scroll, you're thinking about a person in your life and you are selecting the colors and telling the story and then you share it with a group. Now that's not present in the exhibition, but it's present presence is felt in the installation. I I agree. I agree that for some reason people, well, it's so tactile. You know, you take your shoes off and you go into that space. You can touch it. People were laying down, Down you know, laying down on it. But you do feel something special in there and more than just rolled up pieces of fabric. It's more than rolled up webbing. There's something different that I couldn't quite put my finger on, but maybe that's it. That's the stories, you know, Mm -hmm. that each one of those represents an individual who made it and a story about their lives Hmm. and usually about other people that were connected to them. And the power of that is the power of art, that the human connection happens even in the most simple selection of colors and making a simple scroll. That goes back to ancient times when we made those scrolls. And the scroll is when you do those kinds of, oh, I can't remember. There's a particular, it's like the 
inside of a shell. There's a particular term for it, which escapes me right now, but it is one of the great old forms about the story of the universe. Huh. You know? It's kind of a spiral yeah, shape. It's a spiral it's, shape. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. You are spiral shape. Yeah. I kept <laughs> right because we're not videotaping this. No one else was going to be able to see you drawing on the I kept on the table. Spirals <laughs> yeah. on the table, but there's an actual science word that describes those spirals. But the spiral is. You know, hmm. it's a very powerful image and you see it throughout the history of art and then it's brought into a wonderful new focus. Yeah. All right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that there's more and more science being done. And I actually, maybe it was Dee from mm-hmm. the Center for Brain Health had told me about this article and I'll put all of this in the mm-hmm. show notes, but it was the research was in a science journal, Human Brain Mapping. Mm-hmm. And it revealed that awe may help stop us from ruminating on our problems mm-hmm. and daily stressors. Mm-hmm. Instead, awe seems to pull us out of ourselves and make us feel immersed in our surroundings and the larger world, which may also help explain its tendency to inspire generosity and a sense of connection with others. that's great. Yes, I'll link it and I'll send it directly to Mm -hmm, you. But it's like you're saying that you created the Power of Observation Framework based on your work and art and your experience, all of your experiences, science is creating something else. Mm-hmm. They validate each other right. or they they ground each other. The science grounds the experience and experience grounds the science. Right. So it's, it's just beautiful. Exactly correct. Mm-hmm. You know, and a couple of years ago, you know, the annual what is my New Year's resolution yes. thing? Which, you know, I'm <laughs> yeah. going to lose 20 pounds. I'm going to save 20% of my income, blah, 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 which I have failed to do for years. What, <laughs> what I did decide one year, three years ago, was to live life with joy. It's one of the discoveries out of my do something new practice, mm-hmm. to live life with joy. That's it. And so if I'm not being joyful, if I'm not really happy in a moment, guess what? I have absolute permission to get up and leave. Sometimes it's very very difficult. And sometimes I do have to suffer through the bad meetings to get to the joyful parts. But boy, when you live your life that way, is that is your morning affirmation. Awe and wonder are very much a part of that experience uh, all yeah. day long. You seek them out, which yeah. is different than they just happen to you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that is why I think both do something new is such a driving force in my own personal life as a practice, because it's It's something I strive for on a daily level is to have those peak moments where I'm transformed. Yeah, yeah. And the power of observation, what came from that as a way to help others begin to learn how to see, as somebody said, I want to see like you see. And I go, (laughs) I, you know, you don't actually see with your eyes, you see with your brain. It's all the images come into your eye, you know, the colors Uh and the lights and the rods and the cones, and then it goes into your optic nerve, but you haven't seen anything. Huh. It's not until it gets into your brain. Well, and our that, brain is all over our body, which yeah, is the yeah. another thing that's right. happening is that we're finding, we're finding out you know, that, that we've got three, you know, the head and the heart and the gut. There's neuro pathways in all of these. And all of that. Yeah. And so it's really in those moments of it's in that transformation of the hundreds of thousands of images that you see every day that how you select out, how you focus in, what you mm. choose to have as that experience in the day is something you can train for and be open to. Yeah. And so that's why for me, they're different to do something new in the power of observation, but they are fundamentally conjoined, Mm -hmm. you know, and one is a practice of my life and one is a way in which to share with others how you can begin to have those experiences. Yeah. In a sense, you objectified what comes naturally for you in a way then that you could share it and particularly in a way that was meaningful for people that didn't want to see Mm -hmm. you waving your hands and all that. They wanted something really concrete and you and went to framework. sleep and woke up. And <laughs> yeah, it's a very good thing for me to go to sleep and wake up. Yeah, yeah. all of us, all of us. Well, this feels like a good time okay. uh, to stop. And this has been delightful. Now, my word before I knew do something new uh-huh. and wonder and awe was the feeling of being delighted. Mm-hmm. Like I would know, oh, it's a full body yeah. feeling of this being delighted. And 
that's why I'm feeling right now. Yeah, so great. thank you so much You're for welcome. this time and inviting me into your beautiful space here and taking the time. Oh, yeah. I will, like I said, I'll put in the notes how people get their hands on this. Mm-hmm. We'll get that out there. Great. And yeah, thank you. Well, this, this has, has been, been beautiful. Terrific. All right. I really enjoyed it. All right. Thank you, Bonnie. If you like what you heard today, subscribe to Rise Leaders Radio on your preferred podcast platform. Your ratings, reviews, and shares are also really appreciated. You can also visit rise-leaders.com for all the resources we talked about today and to work with me if you're committed to making your unique and positive impact. Thank you for listening and remember, elevate your part of the world. Mm -hmm.